afternoon, everyone. Buenos Aires. I'm Carrie Richman, the Director of Undergraduate Studies for the Institute for Latino Studies. And it's just a huge pleasure to see you all here today. And so on behalf of the Institute for Latino Studies, as well as the Gallivan Program in Journalism, Ethics, and Democracy of the Department of American Studies, as well as the Mexico Working Group of the Kellogg Institute, it's a huge pleasure to welcome my friend and the great journalist and writer, Sam Quinones, back to Notre Dame, and to introduce him and his work to you. Sam has been the chronicler of Mexican migration to the U.S. for the past several decades. In my humble opinion, no journalist has contributed more to our understanding of the myriad facets of Mexican movement to this country, to every corner of the United States, and to our respect for the ordinary heroes whose lives we share in his countless writings, in countless articles for the LA Times where he worked for 10 years reporting about immigration, gangs, drug trafficking, the border, and Mexico, and where he lived in Mexico for 10 years from 1994 to 2004. He's published many articles in magazines and other newspapers, including the New York Times, and you may have been reading some of his front page articles in the recent past. Sam is the author of three books, True Tales from Another Mexico, 2001, from the University of New Mexico Press, Antonio's Gun and Delfino's Dream, True Tales of Mexican Migration, also published by the University of New Mexico Press in 2007, and his book this year, Dreamland, The True Tale of America's Opiate Academ uh, Epidemic, published by Bloomsbury Press. Dreamland is, in my opinion, a tour de force about so many key and pressing concerns, including deindustrialization, job loss, suburban affluence and suburban isolation, overconsumption, health care, pain medication, heroin, law enforcement, rancheros, and Mexican rancheros in the United States. Sam will be talking about this groundbreaking book, so get ready to be stunned, informed, saddened, and jolted into taking action. Please welcome Sam. Uh, well, well, thank you so much, Karen, for uh, the invitation once again to come out uh, to uh, South Bend. Um, can you all hear me in the back there? Yeah? My voice kind of carries, doesn't it? Okay, good. <laughs> good. good. Um, say, I'm not sure how many of y'all uh, heard the, uh, the, the Pope's speech this morning. Uh, that was a, a thing of beauty, I thought. Um, really, uh, you know what I liked about it was um, as much about what he said, which is we can always hear again and again, uh, community, healing, unity, cooperation. These are all themes that I believe are very connected to our, um, the lack thereof, very connected to um, our heroin problem in America today. But what I also like uh, about the speech, perhaps as much as that was, uh, you know, the way he said it, you know, it was like very softly and quietly. We live in a culture where everything's screaming at us. You get the 24 hour news, you get um, the internet, you get um, ESPN with the athletes blowing hard. I mean, it's just uh, it's just a blast. You, you very rarely get a, a, a nice, sweet moment of contemplation, which is why I love the fact that you brought up Thomas Merton, uh, who I have a kind of a feeling for and don't know a whole lot about, but 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 that that kind of contemplative thing, a, a way of life, is a, is something I think in this country we we um, have lost a lot of and could use a lot more of. Um, anyway, I just, I'll talk a little bit about about, um, about some of these things that he brought up that I think are connected to our current problems, as I said, with opiate addiction and, and heroin in, in America. I want to start, though, by uh, telling you a little bit about, um, about how this book got started, um, Dreamland. Um, I had come back from the, from Mexico. I lived in Mexico ten years, and in that time, 
Uh, I had gotten to know a lot, I traveled all over Mexico, written two books, as Karen said. I uh, came back to the LA Times in 2004, and in 2005, the, this nasty medieval almost drug war kicked off in, in Mexico with all these warring cartels and everything. I was put on a team of reporters to write about how Mexico, uh, to cover this, my job, because I was in LA, spoke fluent Spanish, New Mexico, was to talk about how drugs were processed or tra trafficked once they cross the border. A lot of talk about how it crosses the border, but not much about how what happens then. So as part of that, uh, one day, it was in 2009, I was Googling and trying to figure out what, what, what story I might do. <coughs> And I came upon a series of stories about a spate of drug uh, heroin overdoses, black tar heroin overdoses, in Huntington, West Virginia, right on the Ohio River. i never been to um, uh, West Virginia, but I did not associate it with heroin addiction. It was, you know, I grew up in the 70s watching, you know, French Connection, Serpico, all those great heroin movies from the 1970s, all about New York, right? You know, so it's this. West Virginia and heroin just do not associate in my mind. Also, I had been a, uh, a, a crime reporter for uh, four years. Before I went to Mexico, I was a crime reporter in the town of Stockton, California, my second hometown. Uh, love that town, even though, uh, sadly, it's a fantastic place to be a crime reporter. Uh, you never stop working. I ran a marathon basically every day uh, covering the crime in that town. but. Um, what I learned there was, uh, with regard to this issue, was that I, I saw what black tar heroin was. I'd never seen black tar heroin, and I realized from talking with them and the DEA and a variety of other sources that black tar heroin is only made in Mexico, in this hemisphere, and it's only, for a long time, was really only on the western side of the United States. Never really went east. So my question was that day, why is there so much black tar heroin in Western, in West Virginia that it could kill a dozen people? There was a dozen deaths in six months. Could have been a lot more had the paramedics not been more uh, quick acting. I call up the cops, the Huntington PD narcotics sergeant. He goes, you know, thing is, um, all our addicts go to Columbus, Ohio, to buy their drugs. That's where this is all emanating from. So I call up the DEA. And God bless this one guy for getting on the phone. He was, uh, you know, when you deal, you're a reporter, you deal with the DEA, you can deal with some pretty buttoned down cats. They just don't want to talk at all, and oh, talk to the PIO. This guy was not one of those. He was from New Jersey, Italian American guy, liked to let you know that he had been on the streets for a long time, had this kind of New Jersey accent. And he then regaled me for about 20 minutes about his heroin problem. He says, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have a any heroin in Columbus, Ohio. No heroin in Columbus, Ohio. Now, then, then about 10 years ago, we noticed there's a bunch of Mexican guys driving around in cars with their mouths filled with little balloons of 10th gram uh, doses of, of, of heroin, uh, like chipmunks they look, you know, there's a pack with this. And there was this new system that they were all part of. And I've been a DEA agent 25 years, I've never seen this. Where everybody, this, this group of guys, these drivers, were all part of a, a crew that delivered pizza. I mean, delivered heroin like pizza. <laughs> so you, as the addict, would call the operators, an operator standing by to take your order. The operator would then call one of these drivers circulating throughout the city of Columbus with his mouth full of 25 or so little little balloons full of uh, black tar heroin and say, okay, there's an addict that, uh, there's a guy, a customer at, you know, this part of town, you go get it. And usually the, the deal was made in some Burger King parking lot or some Safeway parking, whatever it happened, Kroger's parking lot, whatever it happened to be. And the guy would pull up, the addict who really knows how to find these guys when you're an addict and you really are Jones and you really got to find these guys constantly. That's how cops would spot these guys. It would be a, a, a kid in a car doing this, watching for a Mexican guy driving by, follow the Mexican guy to a, 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 a parking lot somewhere, get in the car with them. The Mexican guy would spit out five balloons, give them a saliva gooey kind of bunch of balloons, 
and the, the, the transaction would take place. And that kind of transaction took place all, all day long. They, had, they went by business hours, seven in the morning to seven at night. There were, at that point in, in Columbus, he figured somewhere on the order of six to eight, maybe even 10 crews working just like that, servicing the attics of, of, of Columbus. They, he, he went on, he says, you know, the other thing was, they don't ever use guns. They're not about shooting it out, killing it over dope. Like I used, you know, like the Scarface, Al Pacino character, all that kind of stuff. It was not about that. This was about customer service. <laughs> this is about if you buy from me six days a week, I'll give you a free one on Sunday. Uh, if you bring me five new addicts, I'll give you 50 balloons. This, this kind of come on, we're constantly part of this, of this, of this business. Um, <coughs> excuse me. They, they were like franchises, basically, these, these crews, just like franchises. Um, I thought this was fascinating. Then he tells me something kind of changed my life. He goes, and you know the strange thing is, crazy thing is, they're all from the same town in Mexico. And that right there, that definitely, got, I thought to myself, a terrific story. A guy, a, a town in Mexico that services, just does nothing but service Columbus, Ohio. And I said, which town is that? He, he talks with his case agent who handles this case. He goes, comes back and he says, Tepic. And right there, I knew he was wrong. Um, Tepic is the capital city of the state of Nayarit, small state on the Pacific coast. But I had spent 10 years in Mexico writing a lot about this stuff, and I had this very strong hunch that the system that he was talking about, in fact, drug trafficking in general does not emanate from large cities in Mexico. It emanates from small little towns, ranchos, little villages. Little places where everybody knows each other, everybody's connected, everyone knows where everyone's mother lives. They all went to school together. That's why they don't shoot it out for territory. They don't know each other. And so I didn't think he was lying to me, I just think he had some wrong information. So I said, well, why I got a bunch of names of guys that they had arrested. He says, we arrest these guys all the time. A bunch of them are doing long years in prison. As soon as we arrest them, they send more guys up. So a, a week doesn't pass without these guys showing up after we've arrested their buddies. So I began to write letters to all these guys. I've got indictments and there was 15 names. I'd, write, I'd find out where they were in the prisons, in the federal prison system and write, write uh, 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 letters to them all. And a month passed, I heard nothing back. Now this is usually the way I do my job. I mean, I think you can find amazing stories if you'll simply ask inmates for their story, to, to, to talk to you. Uh, a lot of them won't, but, but enough of them will. So I was sitting there for about a month going, well, I kind of was like thinking maybe I'll do another story, maybe this is not going to really work, you gotta, can't, can't do them all. Until one guy, one guy calls me out of the blue from Columbus, Ohio, he was arrested in Columbus, Ohio. He says, yeah, I'm from this town and we're not from Tepic. I, I, I thought to myself, uh, this had to be from some small town and he says, that's correct. We're from a little town, it's not far from Tepic but we are from a town called Jalisco. Now, if you know Mexico, Jalisco is actually the name of a huge state where Guadalajara is located, but this is a town called Jalisco, they spell it with an X. Jalisco with an X. Jalisco is what they really call it because they to differentiate it from the state. And he began to tell me the story of what I eventually came to call the, the Jalisco boys, who have this system, a Domino's pizza, of heroin-like system, franchise system, that has uh, 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 sopped up all the, the labor in that, in, in, in that town. He said it started in Van Nuys and, and Canoga Park in uh, Southern California in the 1980s. Back then, this was before they had pagers really even, a few families of immigrants who had landed in the San Fernando Valley also had connections to opium supplies from the Indians in the mountains who, who grew opium poppies in the mountains of Nayarit. They would take the gum, and a few of these families had learned how to cook that gum. That, they call it gum. It's really kind of a goo that you process from the, from the opium poppy <laughs> into, into heroin, black tar heroin. They knew how to cook it. A few of them. It was like a folk craft. They began to sell it and in the parks. Uh, in, in San Fernando Valley, kind of cutting off little pieces to the addicts who come up. And uh, th that's how the business began. In the late 1980s, they graduated to pagers. A couple of things happened. 
the few families that had this business, kind of the word leaked out around this town. More and more people began to come up and start the business or work for these guys and then go off on their own. A kind of an ethos of like live and let live it existed because everybody knew each other. And so it didn't really bother anybody if one person worked for you for six months and then went and started a business that competed with yours. It was just something you had to deal with. After a while, San Fernando Valley was packed with these guys. The LAPD begins to figure it out, begins to make arrests. The same time, really important, the gangs, the Latino street gangs in LA begin to tax drug dealers, a very important phenomenon we don't need to get into right now, but basically they begin to tax drug dealers who they can identify in their neighborhoods. You have to pay to sell dope in our, in our territory. These guys, the Jalisco boys, say, okay, we don't, want, we don't want to do that. We don't want to deal with these cholos, you know, gang members. We hate gang members. So they all, they, all, they begin to graduate to cars. They drive around in cars. They have the pagers now. So pay, people can pay. You can, the, the guy who's selling the dope can page his driver and says, you got to go, sell, you gotta go uh, take this dope over to uh, Safeway parking lot, and there's going to be a guy waiting for you there. It begins to evolve as a system around about this time. Of course, as cell phones later on come around, it helps enormously. The this, this system just explodes because of cell phones. In the early 1990s, late 80s, early 1990s, a few of the more intrepid of these guys begin to say, we're done with San Fernando Valley. We're going to look for new markets, very much like just the expansion of a, of a, of a, a typical corporation. We start small, and then we begin to look for new markets. The first went uh, to um, uh, Pomona, Ontario, it's about 35 miles east of, uh, of LA. Uh, a few went to, uh, one guy went to San Diego, a couple of guys went to Portland, uh, Honolulu, Reno. Little by little, through the early 90s, these guys begin to expand like a, a modern franchise system. And they do it based on, on, on a couple of, of important things. First of all, they have control of supply. Opium, the black tar heroin, they control it. They, they don't allow it to be stepped on or diluted. Is the, uh, uh, stepped on means still kind of cut. And so uh, they, they're selling a very high potency kind of, kind of heroin. That's number one. But number two, they really figure out how to unlock the value in a kilo of heroin. Most traffickers in, from Mexico do not want to sell retail. It's too dangerous. You're selling by the small little gram, a tenth of a gram. It's too dangerous. These guys figure out that if we use cheap Mexican labor, we can unlock all the value there is in a kilo of heroin. Instead of making 38,000, we can make 300,000. But how do you, you have to find guys who will do it, and that's what they set about doing. They began to use their cousins, and little by little began to grow. A couple of things helped enormously. One thing, when I was in Mexico, I traveled around. Every immigrant village that I went to, every place where vill villagers had gone north in huge numbers, the one thing they always had in common was houses that had just been built and out of the houses was always sticking rebar. Now the reason for that is that most, uh, uh, in, in Mexico for many years, it's changed a little bit, but, but for, for a long time it's not the case, most working class poor Mexicans do not have access to home loans that would allow them to build their house all at once. So you build it piecemeal over a period of, could be eight, 10, I've seen 15 year houses that still are not finished. To, according to how much money you can save in the United States, you bring it home, you invest it in the house, and then you go back and then like, like that over a period of a number of years. When you're done with that, the first floor, most people put rebar up because they say, I'm going to build that second floor when, I'm, when I get the money. So in every kind of uh, uh, cityscape for any, any immigrant, the, 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 the skyline to any immigrant village almost always includes lots of rebar. I went down to Jalisco Nayarit as part of my first story for the LA Times. And the first thing I noticed was an entire town, no rebar. That's because heroin allows you, the capital, to build an entire house in nine months or a year, not 10 years, not nine years, 10 years. What it also does is it raises the level, the standard by which you are judged to have, been, to have arrived. If you have, are now building a house 
that, that, that is, uh, uh, takes 10 years to finish, that's no longer good enough to look good in the eyes of your, of your fellow rancheros, your, your family, your, your relatives, all the people that you, that you um, grew up with. Heroin, it lost, it, lost, it lost for a lot of other things, wrought iron, tile floors. One guy told me when his, when, in his village, when, uh, which is near Jalisco, it's Jalisco and then a bunch of little villages all around there, much smaller than, than the town of Jalisco. He said when the first guy came home that he knew personally, built a house that had um, uh, automatic garage door opener, you know? The old people just stood out in front of the house to watch the door go up and down and up. No one had ever seen that before. It was like this major revelation that you could have a house built in nine, ten months and it would have a, you know, a door, this kind of thing. That was like a recruiting poster. A few houses like that are like recruiting posters. This is what you get. You don't have to wait 10 years to build a house anymore. And if, you're, if you don't have any connection in the United States, you don't have any land, you don't have anything, there's no chance you'll ever be building even a, a hovel. So this all of a sudden was like a narcotic, basically, to a lot of young guys who didn't have anything, who were sugarcane farmers, who were bakers, construction workers, jobs that really don't lead anywhere uh, uh, in, in Mexico. Second thing that really helped expand the labor pool, first was the houses, the idea that you could also, I have to say, a few guys would come home with a lot of money and, and, and all the girls would flock to them. That right there is a pretty, pretty serious incentive for every other guy to start wanting to go sell heroin. Uh, a few guys began to pay for the, all the booze in the, in the plaza one night. You know, the big magnanimous guy, hey, everybody in with my friend tonight, you know. And uh, that just wasn't done by a lot of poor sugarcane farmers and bakers and stuff like that. You, nobody had enough money to ever do that. Another thing, however, really helped expand the labor pool to allow for the system to expand. And that was that they determined early on, like trial and error, they figured out that this pizza delivery system of heroin was especially effective at accumulating a, a transforming, I should say, small, cheap doses of black tar heroin that cost them very little to make into big, big stacks of Levi's 501 jeans. Levi's 501 jeans in the 1990s in particular, when the system was expanding, were like the gold standard of rural Mexican menswear. I was in Mexico at that time and I know how big a deal it was to have a pair of Levi's 501s. They were extraordinarily expensive. NAFTA really had not kicked in to, to the degree it would later do. So they were very expensive. They were in stark contrast to the really cheap Mexican jeans that were viewed as really, you know, um, in low class and, and everything. A few guys figure out a couple of key things. First of all, Addicts in the United States are spectacular shoplifters. So, if you tell them, I will trade you dope for a brand new pair of Levi's 501 jeans, they will clean out Sears or Mervyn, remember that company, uh, JC Penney's, Target. They will come and you can give them orders. I want Levi's 501s, uh, this size is gonna be for my uncle. You know, And these guys would come home with their car, with their trunks full of clothes, a lot of stuff, perfume, maybe jewelry, shoes, but mostly Levi's 501 jeans. And if you spend an hour walking around the plaza on Friday night with your brand new Levi's 501 jeans, that was like this spectacular recruiting poster. And so by the mid-1990s, guys in that, in that area began to figure out, if I go north, I can sell dope, I'll be put on a salary, they'll pay me 300 to 500 bucks a week, I'll sell dope all day long, and I'll come home, and I will be king for, what, six weeks, until the money runs out. And this became the narcotic of these guys. These guys, the narcotic was not the drugs, they never used heroin. I don't, still don't know any of them that used heroin. But the, nar the narcotic was to come home the great magnanimous, giving, giving People, giving people, uh, uh, giving away uh, 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 Levi's 501s to your friends, to your relatives, as if you were Santa Claus, walking around the plaza, have all the girls want to talk to you, buy the beer and the, and the tequila for everybody all night long. This was what pushed 
hundreds, thousands of guys, an entire, basically an entire generation. If you were like 15, beginning in like the early 90s, for the next 20 years, you basically all, that entire generation in Jalisco, in all these villages and pretty soon towns around there, all of those villages began to contribute labor and this sit and this, this uh, uh, business model expanded uh, geometrically. <coughs> now, connected to all this, but very, in some, in some ways connected to all this, but dramatically separate from all this, at the same time, was uh, uh, the United States was going through a revolution in pain management. We held, we, we had a bunch of uh, uh, pain specialists in this country who came to believe that um, we were under treating pain. And in truth, they were, they were correct in a lot of cases. This, they, had, they were emerging from, a, from an era in which uh, nobody was ever prescribed a narcotic painkiller almost for any reason, right? It was just not done. So there was this fear of addiction all across, across the country. So people could be dying of cancer last six months and people would still not prescribe an opiate painkiller which would allow them to live in, in, uh, in some of these, uh, free of pain the last six months. These guys were kind of crea uh, uh, seared by this experience. You, you spend enough time around people who are dying of cancer and you cannot give them a certain kind of drug that you know will alleviate their pain. As a doctor, that will change how you view the world. And these guys began to, there was a crew of them around the country who came to the belief that we really had, a, had to tra dramatically tra change how we treated pain. They came to believe that we were, at, we were in the middle of an epidemic of pain. That there was pain untreated all across the country. And at first, the idea was we needed to treat dying cancer patients with, with opiates. Up to that point, there was a, such a fear of, of addiction that no one would ever do it. If you were ever a given uh, opiate uh, painkillers, which was three doctors' signatures, it was a very difficult, very difficult thing to, to, uh, uh, to, to get. They began to argue that this is uh, outrageous, this is inhumane, and, and, and it was not a, a difficult argument to win to say uh, dying cancer patients ought to be provided this, these, this, this uh, medication. <laughs> what ended up happening though was that they took that argument all the way to the extreme. And as, as time went on, they began to argue every pain needs to be treated this way, or this ought to be used. We ought to be free to use these pills for almost any, for almost any kind of pain. They began to find certain pieces of medical literature, not to say studies or anything, they kind of uh, 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 magnified the, the importance of these, these studies. Really, they weren't studies at all. They were just kind of like mentions, footnotes, and this kind of thing, a letter to the editor, this kind of thing. Eventually, though, they came up with the, with the idea that, the, that prescribing these pills, we now know as scientists, as, as doctors, we now know that you can prescribe these pills and they will be virtually non-addictive when used to treat pain. It was this complete transformation, it was a revolution in thinking about how to use opiate painkillers. They used very uh, uh, specious uh, uh, scientific uh, data, as I said. What they were really responding to was a widespread desire among doctors to, to use these pills, but they couldn't find a way to, to, let, to, to rationalize it. So they came up with the idea that all of a sudden these pills were not non-addictive. Virtually non-addictive was the buzz phrase. Another was less than 1% of all patients get addicted when, you, when these are used to treat pain. There was no scientific support for this idea, but they ran with it. They ran with it and they, they kind of created a new conventional wisdom. So by the 19, early 1990s, mid 1990s, there was an entire shift in America in how we treat pain and it is with us today. Uh, there was a, uh, the, a part, as part of that, there was an idea that because we're a country in pain, that uh, pain was now the fifth vital sign. I'm not sure if anybody's heard this idea, that uh, you had to treat 
uh, uh, measure pain the same the way you would do uh, heartbeat or pulse or this kind of thing. And, and this began to change doctors' ideas. They, they were primarily interested in changing the attitudes of doctors all across, all, all across the country. And in this, they succeeded. They were helped by certain pharmaceutical companies, in particular, the company that makes OxyContin, which you might have heard of. OxyContin is made by a company called Purdue Pharma. It came out in 1996, this drug. It's, a it's really just a time-release drug of oxycodone. Oxycodone is a drug that is molecularly very similar to heroin. It's a fantastic um, uh, uh, painkiller. It's also extraordinarily addictive, but not according to the conventional wisdom uh, 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 of the time. So <clears throat> as time went on, more and more doctors began to accept the idea that you could prescribe these pills for almost anything. And we began to see then, when I, when I was uh, in 87, I had my, uh, my wisdom teeth pulled. I think I got Tylenol or something like that. Now you get an opiate, Vicodin or Percocet or something like that. Everything, I got uh, my appendix out in 2009. They gave me 60 Vicodin to take home with me. This is what you get. You go to surgery, you get this. They push it on you, in fact. Um, I didn't know what that was, but the message in that bottle was, of 60 Vicodin, each of which held uh, uh, doses of hydrocodone, which is like oxycodone, very similar to heroin. The message in that bottle was, go ahead and take it. It's non-addictive, virtually non-addictive. The whole medical establishment bought this idea. It was a remarkable shift, remarkable shift, unlike anything else. We went from using almost no morphine, no opiates at all, to today, we use 85% of the world's oxycodone, 98% of the world's hydrocodone today. I mean, that is a radical, radical revolution. These pills, uh, the, the massive prescribing, some of it very uh, uh, sensible, because if some people do need these pills, some people are helped by these pills. Too many people, though, are prescribed these pills without any knowledge of their background. Do you have addiction in your, in your past? Is your father an alcoholic? Have you been, did you smoke marijuana? Any of this kind of stuff, none of this stuff gets asked. It's just, these pills are non-addictive, but prescribe them to everybody. And that's basically what's happened since about 1996. Purdue Pharma began promoting Oxycontin like an over-the-counter drug. They had a, a thousand sales reps out there coming the country. They were going to doctors, trying to convince them, do this, prescribe this stuff, it's not gonna addict your patients. Nonsense, complete nonsense, it, it turned out. They, 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 the pharmaceutical, the camp, promo campaign involved hats, Oxycontin hats, and pencils, and foam pads, and they had a, trips to Scottsdale and to Florida, and they had um, a, a CD called uh, Swing in the Right Direction with Oxycontin, uh, which had a lot of, uh, Count Basie and Woody Herman and swing tunes from the, band, the big band era, this kind of thing. That together with the pain specialists promoting the idea that we needed, to, we had a pain epidemic and we, there was really only one way to treat this and that's for pain pills, along with the, uh, the uh, insurance companies beginning to cut back on other kinds of pain <laughs> treatment that might, might help, leave, left doctors with only one tool and that was opiate painkillers, Vicodin, Percocet, Oxycontin, and several others you may, may, have, may have heard of. These pills, this was like this massive rising sea level of pills all across America, in every corner of America. One place that was really hit hard by this was a town I spent a lot of time in, on the Kentucky, uh, Ohio border on the river, a town called Portsmouth, uh, which at one point had been this great all-American town. It was the town that had the first NFL night game in the stadium that they had in the 1920s, the team that, that had that game later, a couple of permutations later, became the Detroit Lions. It had a uh, steel plant, it had a bunch of shoe factories, uh, it had a beautiful main street, it was selected all-American town, two years in all-American city, two years in a row, and it had at its center the biggest swimming pool in America, the size of a football field. Life itself took place. This was like the, the center of the community was this, was this football field, was this swimming pool. 
and life itself kind of revolved around the swimming pool. Kids were, uh, when they were born, they were toddlers, they were in the shallow end, then they got the middle school and the middle end, then high school, they're diving off the diving board, then they go over here and, and have, you know, uh, they lose their virginity in, in, the, in the grounds around, around the pool. That's how big it was. This was an enormous field as well, baseball. Uh, uh, basketball, all these different activities you could do. You'd have kids, and you'd take them right back to the shallow end, and life itself, would, life would continue. It was like this circle of, of, of life. Everybody uh, used the pool as a, as a uh, babysitter, parents who dropped their kids off all day long. Everybody knew that they'd be safe. It was this egalitarian thing. It was like the country. It's like a metaphor for the country. There was more room for everybody. Everybody looked the same because they're all in swim trunks. And the name of that town, of that pool, was Dreamland. Hmm. Portsmouth in 1980 loses its steel factory. Uh, Main Street begins to, 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 to decline. Uh, the uh, population is cut in half eventually. And in 1993, Dreamland, this gorgeous pool, part of the, the memories of so many people from that town, closes. And over a period of a couple of years, uh, is eventually torn up, dug up, and in its place, literally, it is now buried beneath a an enormous strip mall parking lot with an O'Reilly's Auto Parts store there. The town lost the essential girdings of community. Which is what I think the Pope was talking about today, a little bit. It lost what kept it together as a community. It lost the thing that brought people together to, so that everybody could watch your kids. You might be off working, but everyone's paying attention, and we'll mention to you later if they saw your son smoking cigarettes behind the, behind the, uh, the, the, the pool filter or whatever. It lost its basic greetings, lost its people, lost its jobs, and finally it lost its kind of soul when, it, when the pool was dug up. A place like that is easy prey for opiates. Heroin, uh, opiates in general, turns everybody into a uh, solitary, narcissistic, self-absorbed, hyper-consumer. You're thinking of buying one thing all, all day long, over and over again. That's all you care about. This is what happened to the town. The town turns in on itself, has no place to meet, has no place to see each other, to, to, to socialize, to be a community. And little by little, the pills take over. Walmart literally becomes the social scene. It takes the place of dreamland. The only place where people see each other, literally after a while, is Walmart. Of course, it's in passing, hey, how you doing, this kind of thing. An, enorm an entire town grows addicted. This town becomes the center of what comes known as the pill mill. The pill mill is, if, if you do enough uh, study and research about opiates, you'll figure out that, that um, they lead to business models. The reason is they turn every customer, every person who uses it, into a faithful daily customer. You cannot not use. You cannot not buy one day. Oh, I think I'll go this week and not use any oh, now. That's not going to happen. The drug will force you to buy every day. When you have a customer who's that faithful, you can design an entire business around it very, very easily. In Portsmouth, you had the Jalisco business model on one hand, that's uh, another thing. In Portsmouth, the business model was doctors realizing that they could sell prescriptions, basically. That's what it ended up being. Long lines of people waiting to get their prescription every month. You had to show up to get a prescription to these pills. You had to show up in person per federal law. So pretty soon you'd have lines out the door as one after another would go in to see the doctor and say, Doc, I got it. Oh, okay, here. You know, no diagnosis. No 250 bucks, please. And then the lines were like notorious. They would go and go and go. People would fight all the time. People wouldn't be in pajamas. You don't care if you're strung out. You don't really care what you look like. All you want is your prescription. There'd be... Uh, um, uh, uh, people getting pizza order in line because they won't lose their place. The pill mill, Portsmouth becomes the extreme example of what the pain revolution does to America. Because it's so vulnerable. Quite a bit like, you know, I think the Indians, when the Spaniards came over, or, or I'm sorry, the Spaniards, but also the, uh, the, the uh, Europeans, basically. They're so, they had no defenses to smallpox. Portsmouth had been stripped of all its defenses, community defenses, and left it vulnerable to this drug. 
in particular, the way the reason I went to Portsmouth was because it became there was a dozen pill mills in a town of twenty thousand. They they prescribed nine million pills for a town of twenty thousand people in one year. Of course, people were coming from all over. This was the far extreme of the of the pain revolution in Portsmouth for about a decade. You had you could do you could buy there was an oxycon economy. You could buy anything you wanted for life itself with pills. The central bank in this oxycontin economy were all these pill mills. They kept the, the money supply going. You could buy T-bone steaks, children's shoes, dental appointments, cars, refrigerators, anything you wanted. Walmart, I believe, was central to this as well. Walmart was, uh, first of all, it was the pricing regulator. So uh, basically, dealers would pay you half of the value of whatever you as a shoplifting addict would bring them. So if it was a, a chainsaw, you would bring it to him and he'd pay you half of whatever in pills. Uh, if it was a $100 chainsaw, he'd give you $50 worth of pills. But if there wasn't a price on it, and the dealer didn't know what the price was, he would call Walmart. Hey, I got the, uh, what's, what's the price on a uh, Black & Decker or whatever? Oh, that's a 79 bucks. Okay, 80 bucks. I'll give you $40 in pills. I also believe Walmart was crucial. This was, this was like in the early days, in the early, late 90s, early 2000s, when it really began to explode. And I believe Walmart was crucial in all this for, for the following reason. Had there, not, had there been a more economically diverse, uh, 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 well, a, a, a more diverse economy in, in, uh, in Portsmouth, locally owned, had Main Street still existed, I do not believe it would have spread from these, this ground zero area the way it eventually did because the businesses would have been there to defend their businesses. They would have known who the junkies were and said, no, I'm not going to let you in my, my store, still shoes. But also an addict would have had to go from store to store to store to store to steal enough money to make the nut every day. Oxycontin required, unlike these other pills, a Vicodin and Percocet, which one guy told me, you know, if you needed money for the pill, you could find enough for a pill in, like in the, in the crevices of your couch. That was cheap stuff. Oxycontin cost a dollar a milligram on the street, and you needed 200 milligrams. You had to find a lot of stuff to steal. By the time this happened, Walmart had taken over the retail in, in, those, in, in Portsmouth and many other communities around, and it was the only place you could go to steal everything you needed. So if you wanted to steal a bottle of liquor, a, a, a VCR, whatever it was, you had to go to Walmart to do it. And the thing is, Walmart for a long time had very, very little security. They had these greeters out front, and, and no greeter's going to stop a wide-eyed addict who wants his dope. You know? And so the thing spread. Portsmouth was like a um, canary in a coal mine. It happened, this was in the late 90s, early 2000s long ago when, when people uh, weren't really paying attention to this. This was a major problem. And we, as a country, because we're used to not paying attention to what goes on in Appalachia for the many, many problems they have. And so what happened was it began to spread. It just spread across the country. And we now find it in communities that are quite well-to-do. You find the same problems. And eventually what happened is people switch to heroin. These are pills that are very much like heroin. If you can't afford them after a while, the switch to heroin is kind of a, a no-brainer is how a lot of addicts say that. Ah, makes total sense to go to heroin. To me, it does maybe seem strange, but, but it, it is exactly how, how people um, uh, uh, feel about it. My feeling is that there was a lot of, of uh, reasons, though, of some of this having to do with what the Pope spoke about uh, uh, today that allowed for the spread of this problem nationwide. It was, of course, that doctors were prescribing this all over the country and prescribing it for people who probably didn't need it or certainly didn't need as much. And so we had this massive uh, uh, rising sea level of, of pills all across the country. And that leads to, to heroin addiction everywhere we see it now, which is pretty much in every state in the, in the country. But I also believe that this spread because we had spent decades by then really destroying community in this country. That's my, my feeling. We've been kind of clawing at the girdings of what made community work. 
public assets. We devalued government, mocked government because it was supposedly inefficient, and we lauded the private sector as this endlessly wonderful and, and efficient um, uh, uh, sector of our of our of our society. We had. Um, uh, we had beat communism, we looked at the free market as some kind of infallible god, I, I came to feel. Um, and we kind of almost encouraged jobs to go, to go elsewhere. Like these jobs in, uh, in Portsmouth all went, went somewhere else, that was okay because we're a financial service co country now. We also came to kind of fear the public sphere. I believe this was crucial. We, 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 parents stopped allowing their kids to just go outside. They had to follow the kids and stay in the background and watch and make sure nothing bad would ever happen to them in the public sphere. The private sector, the private sphere was believed to be entirely benign and actually healthy, and, and the public sphere was a place to be, to be um, uh, uh, feared. Um, I think at the same time we acted as a country increasingly, particularly beginning in the, the big uh, economic run-up from the mid-1990s, as if consumption was the path to happiness. The more stuff we had, the better off we would be, we would, the, the happier um, uh, uh, we would be. And then if you add to that, we had suburbs in which there was kind of built, we built isolation and called it prosperity. We had technology that, that allows us to know someone in Chile and not our next door neighbor. All of that um, left us, I believe, uh, dangerously, dangerously isolated. You have kids no longer play in the street, parks go unused, dreamland is buried beneath a strip mall. I, it's my, it's, any, is it any wonder that we have heroin all over the, all over the country? It seems to me like kind of a, a normal, our, our own search for a kind of a painless world to prevent any bad thing to happen to our kids and, and live in this kind of isolated prosperity that we think is so wonderful has led us uh, to this. Heroin, as I said, turns every addict into a solitary, isolated, self-absorbed, narcissistic, hyper-consumer. Just a perfect embodiment of the values that we have fostered over the last, uh, and my, I get 35 um, uh, years. I believe today more strongly than, than ever that community, as I think the Pope, he didn't say this exactly, but I think he would agree, Community is the antidote to heroin. Community is what we need to build neighborhoods that will prevent kids from falling into this. Even, even in houses where, where people are well off, it, it doesn't matter. Poor, poor, poor towns, wealthy towns, everyone is, is isolated, particularly sometimes in wealthy communities. You have houses where the parents and the kids almost don't interact. The kids always got the earbuds in, uh, you know, and once he shuts the door, oh, God forbid the parents should ever go in there. Oh, that's your private space. Every addict I ever talked to said this, this problem emerged and, and expanded in private bedrooms. That's where, that's where your kid gets addicted. That's where your kid hides his dope. That's where your kid hides his phone that has all the numbers that have all, to, to all the connects that he needs. All of that is connected to, the, to our own prosperity. What's, what's a bigger sign of, of prosperity than every kid has his own private, private uh, bedroom? My belief is that if you want to get kids off heroin or keep kids from, from uh, uh, getting involved in this, in this problem, you have to break down those barriers that, that keep people, people isolated. Let them skin their knees. Go out and run around and fall down and have problems and you know it's this this intense desire to keep any bad thing from happening any pain we have to keep us ourselves from feeling any kind of pain it's all related to this whole idea that that we we are we are un, in, a, unable to ever deal with any kind of pain and i think that's way 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 uh, um, overblown it seems to me too what's interesting about heroin in, in america today thinking of it in kind of philosophical terms, is that it also, in some areas, has created the exact opposite effect of what it creates in a human being. Frequently, heroin is so fearsome, so scary, the decline of a heroin addict, an 18 year old kid, into zombie, bright eyed, productive, excited by life, kid, 
into zombie living under the overpass is lightning fast, six months, and it's accomplished. This has, however, I believe in some areas, created a kind of a, uh, uh, an effect that is community building. People, it, it has reminded, at least, in some areas, people of the ties that bind them to others. It's extraordinarily important. We've lost so much of in, in this community. And one place I found that, I'm very happy to report, is the town that got its, basically got started uh, with all this of Portsmouth, Ohio. I went, I was supposed to go to Ohio like once or twice. I ended up going six times to Portsmouth. As I did, I began to understand that they had been kind of, this town looks awful. It looks beaten, it looks like a junkie. You know, bad scars and, and uh, empty buildings and hookers over here and, and check, uh, check catching places over there. And um, it just, so at first I was like, wow, this is really messed up. I can't believe this is my country. But as time went on, I began to see that something else was emerging in Portsmouth, Ohio. It was very important. Portsmouth, Ohio had spent years believing the dogma about itself, this dependency dogma that, that we're nothing. Ch Chicago School of Economics had said, uh, you know, all these jobs, are, the free market is king, and all these jobs are going somewhere else. And uh, um, Portsmouth bought that too, even though they were manufacturing town. They said, okay, we must be nothing because all, all our jobs are going, everybody's leaving. What is there to really believe in in this town? As I, as I spent more time there, though, I found this, um, th these, these stories of resurgence, like a boxer on a mat, kind of getting up off the mat, not just staying beaten. Crucial, one, one moment was crucial, I believe. Part of the, the industrial fabric of the, of the town was its shoe industry. All those shoe fa factories had left except one, and that was really not a shoe factory, but a, um, a shoelace manufacturer. Mitchell Lace. It was the largest shoelace manufacturer in the world for a while, Mitchell Lace was. It had, it had, it, it was this, uh, uh, run by what's called, what I, a term I did not know until I went out there, the third generation. You know, the first generation of the owners builds it up and the seat of the pants business people, real aggressive and, and, and moving. And then the second generation goes to business school and applies modern business principles to the company. And then the third generation plays golf. And everything just kind of falls apart. And that's what happened to Mitchell Lakes, basically, in a nutshell. Now, this, this, was about, this, this company was about to go bankrupt. It was in bankruptcy. And it would have been almost like this final death blow to this town to let that place go under. A couple of business people found out about it, heard about it in the grapevine. Hey, this is going under. And they had no knowledge about how to make shoelaces. But they said it was like almost this crucial moment, like you just, you, you, you couldn't let this happen. If you let this happen, all was truly lost. You were outdone for. They pool their money, an insurance salesman, a lawyer, a contractor. They hire the managers, not the third generation, but the managers actually knew what they were doing. And they bought Mitchell Lace out of bankruptcy. Mitchell Lace today, that was about five years ago, four or five years ago, Actually, now I think it's about five years ago. It employs something like 80 people. It exports shoelaces to Taiwan, to China, to Mexico. It's this amazing thing that happens when you say, I'm not going to just sit there and watch this stuff happen to my community anymore. It's kind of like dependency kind of thing. Like, I'm, I'm just kind of not, I'm just going to sit around and not care. When you act, that's almost like what the town learned. In 2011, the state passes a new pill mill law that makes, makes pill mills uh, illegal and makes it illegal, for example, for a felon to run a pill mill. Believe it, before that, you could run a pill mill, a, pill, a pain clinic, and still be a, 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 a felon. The town gets together, the DEA does a bunch of investigations, and in 2011, about a month after this law is passed, they close all the pill mills in town. So 11 pill mills all of a sudden stop. The Oxycontin economy comes to a halt, and all of a sudden, addicts have breathing room that they never had before. There was such supply of dope in the town that if you wanted to 
to, to, to stop using, you had to like move to Texas or someplace. You could not do it around. All of a sudden, there was like this breathing room around, around town where you didn't need to have all the, the this dope was not always in, in, in your face. The town also did uh, uh, something I thought was crucially important, which was to uh, change its system of government. I'm a longtime uh, reporter. I have a very high regard for the city manager form of government, having a professional run the town. This was not the case in Portsmouth. They said, we'll save money, we'll just have the mayor run the town. Well, the mayor was a cashier at Kroger's. What does he know about running the town? Well, nothing. So the town just was, became this kind of circle of, of like uh, improvisation and recall and finger pointing and acrimony and nothing got done. And they began, with the, with the city manager, they began doing simple stuff like, Hey, how about if we put a light in the park so the hookers don't hang out in the park at night? Oh, that's a good idea. Cost of what? what does a light cost? Fifteen bucks? Did it? All of a sudden, no, no hooker problem in the park. All of a sudden, the town kind of began to break away from this dependency idea, like, like, and, and, and act for itself. And by the time I get, went there last, two thousand people, two thousand people were in recovery from opiate addiction. Now in another town, 2,000 people go, oh my God, what's the problem? But in, in, in Portsmouth, that was a huge, huge accomplishment. There were AA and NA meetings every day of the week, some several times a day. Any time, there were a bunch of new, newly recovered addicts who could help the, the other ones who were coming along and show them how, the way, how to do it. It was like this enormously ex exhilarating time for a town that had been beaten and battered by every kind of major economic and, and social force that you, you could, you could uh, name in America over the last 35 years. I end the book this way. So the battered old town had hung on. It was somehow a beacon embracing shivering and hollow-eyed junkies, letting them know that all was not lost. That at the bottom of the rubble was a place just like them, kicked and buried but surviving. A place that had, like them, shredded and lost so much that was precious, but was nurturing it again. Though they were adrift, they too could begin to find their way back. Back to that place called Dreamland. Thank you very much. Typically, in things like this, if there's a question or two, I'm happy to, yes. <laughs> the immediate question that comes to my mind as you uh, go through that last story is, why did Portsmouth not become prime ground for the Jalisco boys to expand? Yeah, because they had all the pills they ever needed. That was usually people, I mean, in many other places, the pills would get a little bit more expensive and people would switch, that kind of thing. A lot of, in, 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 in Portsmouth, a lot of people just uh, had enough pills. There was never, there was a massive supply of pills in town. And so the Jalisco boys also, you know, the, the Jalisco boys go where there, there are, uh, they sell almost entirely to white people, but they go to areas where there are lots of Mexicans because they want to blend in. Like any mafia, the Italians went to, you know, only where, where the Italians were, right? Well, same thing with these guys. Portsmouth has almost no Mexicans. Mexicans, in fact, are a terrific economic barometer. If you have a lot of jobs, if your economy's growing, you usually have lots of Mexicans. Why? Because they go where the jobs are. New Orleans, before Katrina, had no Mexicans. Before Hurricane Katrina. Detroit, as far as I know, has precious few Mexicans. Nashville has a ton, has like 100,000. Charlotte, same thing, something like that. Well, the whole. Carolinas is just huge numbers, you know. Portsmouth, because it was kind of a dying town, really had a very, very small percent. And so uh, Mexican traffickers kind of tooling around town with their mouths full of heroin balloons would have been too, too obvious. And so, um, but mainly it was because my understanding was that the pills were just everywhere. Now, there are, unfortunately, people who have switched to heroin, but there's also, at the same time, uh, something that is, that is keeping, I believe, the town going is the idea that a lot there's a recovery culture that has grown up around and competing now with the culture of hey let's get high all day long and that's huge that's a 
a total different mindset. The other thing that's interesting, you know, when a town gets a lot of Mexican immigrants, what it gets is a, sh a, a, a shot of, of real energy, dynamism. Folks who come, they want to walk through walls to get ahead, and they bring that, that, that attitude. Turns out, recovering addicts are really similar to Mexican immigrants. Because they are getting like a second chance. They're grateful for that job. They're, 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 I could have died. I could be a, could be a coroner stacked. And here I am with a second chance. And the way I've seen it, the guys that I've known, they are really gung-ho. They'll take any job. They just they work hard. They just they want to get as far away emotionally and, and culturally from that whole let's get high all the time culture that they were so much a part of for so many years. So what ends up happening in a lot of these towns that was that was before opiates, kind of inert and people were fatalistic, you know, what's the point? What are we gonna do? Now that they get some new recovering blood, let's put it that way. It's actually, uh, uh, I, I believe, a really great thing for them. The problem that Portsmouth faces, of course, is a perennial problem, is that they just don't have jobs that mean much. The, the, the jobs are uh, minimum wage, and they, they don't lead many places. Um, that's, that's a structural problem that, frankly, the, a lot of the country faces, I think. But, um, but in, 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 in Portsmouth, you have this, this kind of feeling of rebounding and, and recovery, and people coming together, they have the largest Re uh, um, uh, recovery clubhouse in Ohio, uh, where I spent a lot of time because I would talk to these guys about their 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 lives all for years for for, for, for days you know time, um, and, and so it was it was it was a, it was actually a, a, a really sweet thing because we tend to view the Rust Belt as like uh, hopeless, and maybe for a long time it was I don't know but but it seems to me that in, Port in Portsmouth was an example of. The beginnings, only the beginnings, because if you travel around Portsmouth, you think, what's that guy talking about? This place is like horrid, you know? I mean, it's awful, it looks terrible. But it's, now you've got the first locally owned cafe just, just opened up like about a year ago. Lofts are being built, loft dwelling. This one guy goes, you know, we, we're, we're, selling, uh, we're selling a cool lifestyle. It's been years since anyone sold a cool lifestyle uh, in Portsmouth. This is the guy who built the lofts, you know? He's like. We're looking for hipsters and young, young professionals, and, and they have a, a cafe for everyone to get together, you know, this kind of thing. Um, these are signs that I think are, are really, really hopeful, even though, of course, it's not sugar-coated. The town looks awful, and it's got a long, 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 long way to, uh, to go. But I think the more people go into recovery, the more that passed. And, and, and you know, this is, I was telling someone on lunch today, I believe, that, that um, this is a, most drug scourges, we, we, we debate, de, 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 demand started or, or supply? And my feeling is most of this starts uh, with supply, just excess supply of drugs, you know, and, and that's in this case for sure it happened. There was no massive demand for opiates until people began prescribing them like crazy. Yes? Uh, two topics that were mentioned today, um, pain management at the very beginning, Thomas Merton are each the subject of a talk this Saturday on uh, Saturday with the Saints. The topic this week is Thomas Burton, uh -huh. 30 in the basement of Gaddis. And then at 11 is a talk by the physicians uh, of Notre Dame grads who came to this on pain management in Jordan Hall of Science. And I'd be curious to see how they handle it. Of course, they overlap, so. The, the, the issue is, you know, it, it's because it, they were overprescribed does not mean that these pills don't have a role. They do have a role in modern medicine. They're, they're enormously helpful. For, leaving aside even the people who are dying of cancer, those, for those folks, it's enormous, enormously helpful. Most people who are dying of cancer probably ought to be addicted to, to opiates by the time they die because it helps them, it helps them overcome the, the pain. But it's, it's that massive blast of pills on, for every little thing and huge amounts, you know. <coughs> I think uh, next time I go to a doctor who tries to prescribe 60 Vicodin, I'm going to say, first of all, you're going to have to tell me what's in that pill, and you're going to have to tell me why I need 60. Why not six? You know, or how about just give me six, and I'll come back for the next. If I need 60, I'll get back at you. You know, there's a kind of a, a, a social revolution with regard to medicine that needs to take place as well. Reverting back, I think, a little bit more to what what what, what, what the way things were uh, 20 years ago or so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just came from the uh, other Portsmouth in New Hampshire, which has a very similar heroin problem, but a different source, perhaps. Although they have the same kind of 
uh, pharma underpinnings of the yeah. oxy problem, their you know source is more likely out of the Golden Crescent, you know, in this kind of post-Taliban, you know, U.S. occupation mm -hmm. yeah. connection that we saw in the Vietnam War, out of the covert wars, and that gave us the Golden Triangle. Can you give us some sense of what you see in terms of the scale of the uh, route that you described out of Mexico uh, yeah. versus or in, you know, in relationship of any kind with the Golden Crescent? You know, I would say this, almost none of our heroin comes from Asia anymore. It all comes from Colombia or Mexico. I mean, uh, we have a war, and but here's, here's why. Heroin is a commodity. It varies only, it's not like in you know, Napa Valley wine where you have some varietals that are really great. Heroin is heroin. You can step on it, you can dilute it, and it gets weaker, but it's all heroin. So it's white, brown, brown white powder, brown powder, black tar heroin, it's really all the same. So. The shift happened in the 80s. The Colombians basically took the, the entire uh, West, eastern United States. The Mexicans basically, as I said, had, had the western United States. Now, really, the Mexicans are taking it off, basically. The reason none of the heroin in su significant quantities comes from the, the uh, Afghanistan or Burma or Turkey or places where it is is because it's just too far away. You cannot compete with commodities that come from Mexico, which is just you know a couple hours, a few hours away, or what have you. And so, I, I think the DEA will tell you this. I think I've done a lot of interviewing. I mean, not that no dope ever comes from there, but not a su sustained amount because Afghanistan, for example, that's 7,500 miles away or something like that. It's just an enormous distance, and you there's not enough back and forth to make to hide it, you know. And so. Um, to my way of thinking, it's really, this is a problem, heroin is cheaper than it's ever been because it now comes from Mexico or, or Colombia. Increasingly, even if it comes from Colombia, it's sent to Mexico but then traffic it across into, into the United States. There was a, a really interesting bust about three months ago in New York City, 150 pounds. That's larger than the French Connection bust of the 1970s. I talked to a heroin detective in New York City. He said. That was Colombian heroin sold to the Mexicans in the Sinaloans, in particular. You know, Mexico, Sinaloa is just south of Arizona, about 10 hours or something, just north of Nayarit. Um, and the, the Sinaloans took it in. And so that was, that's the new model. The, the, just like cocaine. Cocaine, the, the, the Colombians ceded the cocaine to the Mexicans. They'll sell the cocaine to the Mexicans. The Mexican cartels, will t or drug trafficking organizations, the term I prefer, uh, will take it in. And, and so the same thing is happening with heroin. And so now, with the Jalisco Boys, for example, what they had, they were the first ones, the importance of the Jalisco Boys was that they were the first ones to figure out this um, pill model. That, that, if they, if, that all these people were getting addicted to pills, if they just hung out and, uh, and, and sold enough of their heroin, for a, after a while, all those addicts would turn into heroin. Addicts. The guy who did it, um, uh, I interviewed him, he's still alive, he's in his 70s. It turns out, he, he's got an interesting story, he's, he's actually Mexican-American. He met a Jalisco boy in prison in Nevada. They kind of form a partnership. The Jalisco guy says, I've got this system, my cousins are working in Honolulu and San Diego, and we've got all the labor you ever need. We've got a steady supply of heroin. What we don't have is connection to the junkie world. We don't know anything about these people. We don't speak English, that's number one. They don't speak Spanish, most of them. So this guy provided that part of the puzzle. He had been on a long time hike, lived, a, a, had been a trafficker, he was in his 50s by then, he had been an addict since he was 19. They combine, and this guy begins to then, um, uh, they, together they begin to set up these stores, and then he, be, he has the idea, I'm gonna go east. And he was really the first one to go east uh, uh, of the Mississippi River to bring uh, black tar heroin in sustained amounts east of the Mississippi River uh, for the first time. And he does so in 1998, two years after OxyContin comes out, two years after Purdue Pharma's big promo, promo came has begun. And he br brings it to Columbus, Ohio, which is kind of like the center of this ground zero where the pills. If you, the ground zero is Columbus to the north, Cincinnati to the west, wheeling over here, eastern Pennsylvania, I'm, I'm sorry, eastern Kentucky, and 
all of it, he brings it there and figures out, he talks to an addict one time, a heroin addict who he meets, and this heroin addict says, first of all, the heroin addict has a new El Dorado and a, tr and a house. And he's never met a, a heroin addict would ever have a new car of any kind, you know. Well, how did you get that? Well, I buy all these Oxycontin pills from the prescription of these seniors in, in Wheeling, and I take it up into the mountains of Appalachia, and I sell it. I make a ton of money. And with that, I buy my, my heroin, but also I buy my truck and all this kind of stuff. And that he had never seen, this guy had never seen Oxycontin before. He didn't know what it was. He, she wanted to trade him dope for the pills. And he said, I don't know what those are. And then she tells him, and that's where he gets the idea, Dan, if I just follow the pills, I'll have a market for the rest of my life. And that's what these guys figure out. They're the first ones, they've they got this weird system. But the importance also of these guys is that they are the first ones to figure out the pill market. That, that there are widespread, huge numbers of new addicts out there. Every, all, all, all over. And all you have to do is wait and they will, they will make that transition. There's one thing they never do though, is they never go to uh, the, the classic heroin markets. New York City, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Washington. Why? Why go? The guys have guns there. You know, these guys are quiet, peaceable. They don't want to be shooting it out for territory, all that kind of stuff. Go to Columbus, there's nobody there. Charlotte, nobody there. Indianapolis, nobody there, you know. And so this is kind of how these guys begin to, to kind of uh, 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 expand. And, um, and, but but it, all of this now really has come far more close to home than, than simply the, the, the guys in, in, um, in uh, whatchamacallit, in, in the, Turtle, the Golden Trump Crescent or whatever you call it over there in Afghanistan, Burma, those areas. Yes? But along with um, the recovery mindset and the culture of recovery, is there institutional support in terms of providing like methadone treatments and things like that? Not very much. This is just beginning. But what we're finding is that heroin is changing a lot of minds, right? Change, heroin is changing a lot of, in a lot of areas where people are fairly conservative. People are, people are seeing their own kids now addicted and all of a sudden, they're changing their attitudes with regard to the proper mix of prison versus treatment, how much, you know, these are, these are attitudes that, the tough on crime attitudes are really being tested when it's your own kid or when it's a neighbor down the street or the cop, the captain of the football team. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just was in um, Northern uh, Kentucky about a month ago and the jail there in Ken Kenton County, um, uh, 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 Kentucky, very conservative area, Libertarian, a very you know red area. The jailer has now converted a whole wing of the jail to a rehab center. Not just a twelve-step meeting every once in a while, but you get up in the morning, you do a program for the rest of the day until you go to bed for three months or six months, just like you would do in a, in a rehab center. The, the question of the form the jail takes is now paramount to kids with parents with kids with who are addicted. Because they never had to think about this. They never, kids never went to prison, anything, this kind of thing. So why do I care about what jail looks like? But now, you can't afford, treatment is so expensive. And you, you go through your savings ridiculously fast. Mortgage, the house, all that kind of stuff. So all of a sudden, one place where you find help is, uh, it, you can find help, or one, one option ought to be jail, except you have to rethink what, jail's, what jail is. And I think you're finding in some areas the harder they hit they are, the more they're rethinking jail. Yeah? What did you find out about, or what did you discover about the efforts to cut off the supply? Which supply, the pills or heroin? <coughs> heroin. Um, well, these guys, you know, I've talked to a lot of guys, uh, cops all across the country, and they all have the same approach, which is just to arrest these guys, but of course they get replaced all the time. There's like a never-ending supply of cheap labor from, from, from Mexico. The problem the police face is, I feel for them, is that if you are in a, in a, in a culture that creates addicts all the time by the abuse and, and oversupply and overprescribing of opiate painkillers, then you will always have new addicts, or heroin addicts. And so if you always have new heroin addicts, you know, there will always be business uh, uh, for them. And so this is, this is what police are, are, are running into. They've done several, uh, they've done two, maybe 
free nationwide bus on these Jalisco guys, but they keep rebounding. And the problem is it's in a context of the private sector having created this idea that pills for everything and, 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 and all of that kind of helps uh, create these, these addicts that keep this, this business you know, going. So um, they, they do what they do, but in, in this context, it's awfully difficult to make any, any kind of dent. It always seems to me like cops are there in the, in the, in the tides, you know, trying to keep back high tide. That's kind of the, the image I have of, of the job that they have, and it's very difficult. Yeah? Yeah, going along with that, because you talk about community as like the antidote for drug addiction, but do you think that there has to be like another revolution in the way that we describe the pain killing Yes. In order to actually really solve it? Yeah, that? I do. I do. And I think what we need to do is spend, is, is all of us, we all, we as American pain patients, need to um, be accountable ourselves to, when we go into a doctor, not expect the doctor to fix us miraculously and also be part of the solution. If the doctor says you're making bad choices, you're eating bad food or whatever, you need to exercise more, we need to act on that. I think a lot of it has to do also with our own attitudes, frankly. I mean, that's how I feel, that we, we, we expect way, way, way too much. We become kind of entitled, feel that like we're entitled to a life without pain, which is crazy. You know, and so, um, but yes, I think I think doctors need to prescribe far less of this. We need we, they need to question why are we providing 60 pain pills to this guy? Almost certainly, he will never use 60. Why not? Because the collateral damage is so large. Why don't we provide prescribe six? And then okay, he has to come back. A lot of times they prescribe a lot because they don't want to see you again. You know, taking up space in their room or their emergency room or whatever it is. But you know that doesn't. That we've seen what happens, and that's not good. So it seems to me like a better idea is to cut back a lot and just have have these pills be. Um, uh, we take accountability, you and me and everybody else. We take accountability for our own health, but also when it does come time to use these pills, because they are helpful, we use them very judiciously, and we try to find other other ways. I, I personally like have been exercising more since I wrote this book. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I don't, uh, uh, I watch what I eat more. I mean, it's, you know, it's like these kinds of things, behavioral things, instead of thinking like I can do whatever the hell I want and the doctor will fix me just like a car mechanic fixes a car. That kind of thing, you know. Anyway, folks, thank you. Oh, yeah. Just quickly, uh, building on what that last question was, as far as what happens if the doctors in the medical field wants to, or because of pressure, tries to limit the prescription of 60 of this or 90 of that, then what happens? The pharmaceutical companies come in and, and what kind of? Well, the pharmaceutical companies pr clearly would not like that, I'm no, sure. No, I mean. But I mean, the we have to take responsibility for ourselves, I think, or in each individual. and and. Um, I think they are, are chastened enough by what's happened to, I mean, if they were ever to, to make a big push like they did in the late 1990s, the way they prescribed, the way they promoted these pills, right. there would be a huge backlash. There was none back then. They were prescribing this stuff like, hey, everybody can get some, you know, should get some. Not a, and what's more, there's a pain revolution in health that if you were a doctor and you didn't prescribe this, you were withholding treatment for your patient, you'd be sued. Patients, doctors got sued for not prescribing these pills, you know. So you create this culture, but I think that culture, we have seen the collateral damage, and it is massive and is nightmarish. Talk to any parent of an addict, and you will see it. It's just a, a nightmarish kind of experience. It goes for years. It doesn't end. It seems like it's interminable. You know, and finally it ends with washing your hands of your child. Uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. That kind of thing searing as it is, and also the fact now that more and more people are coming out and talking about it, just like in the AIDS epidemic, you know, first it was all hidden, now we have these feelings like, well, okay, now we need to talk about it. And I think that's enormously helpful, um, healthy, and also about building community. I mean, I get back to that, that old idea that, that, that we work best when we work, work together. And, um, and this is a, a drug that thrives on, on isolation. That's my opinion. Thanks very much, folks.